beta seron was the first FDA approved drug for multiple sclerosis, 1993, and today it would be considered lower in efficacy. But did it even work at all? Well, in short-term trials, it reduced new MRI lesions, relapses, and short-term disability progression, but was it effective in the long term? Today, I'll show you a study on beta seron with 15 years of follow-up, and we'll see if the treatment group beat the placebo in long-term prognosis. To give a little background, beta seron is beta interferon 1b. Interferons are proteins secreted by the liver naturally in response to viral infections, and they have an effect on the immune system where they shift the T cells to T helper cell type 2 pathway, whereas T helper cell type 1 pathway is associated with inflammation in multiple sclerosis. This drug is given subcutaneously under the skin as a self-injection every other day. The drug Extavia is identical, same dose, same exact drug. It's unpleasant to give yourself the injections, and it can cause some side effects such as flu-like symptoms, though it's very safe and does not increase the risk of infections. There is a small risk of liver injury, in which case the drug may need to be stopped. In early clinical trials, the drug was not very effective, but did reduce MS relapses by about one third. The study we're going to look at is the extension phase of the benefit trial. And this was actually a study in what's known as clinically isolated syndrome or CIS. What this is, is when someone has a first attack of demyelination in the central nervous system. For instance, maybe they have optic neuritis, inflammation of the optic nerve causing pain or vision loss in one eye, or transverse myelitis, inflammation of the spine causing numbness or weakness in the limbs, but they don't meet the diagnostic criteria for multiple sclerosis, but they have a high risk of developing MS. Now, I won't be too technical, but due to changes in diagnostic criteria, virtually all of these people would, by modern diagnostic criteria, be considered to just have multiple sclerosis. So just think of this as a trial in people with early or mild multiple sclerosis that only had one attack, but at the time it was called CIS or clinically isolated syndrome. And they randomized people to beta seron, 250 micrograms every other day versus placebo, and this is the standard dose. And they did five to three randomization, meaning out of eight people, five got the drug and only three got placebo. They did this to help recruit people into the trial because you had a greater than 50% chance to get the drug. And they wanted to see if it would actually prevent people from getting multiple sclerosis or essentially prevent people from having an attack or getting more new lesions on the MRI. Again, as I said, all these people essentially had multiple sclerosis, so we're looking at did it prevent attacks and new MRI lesions. Now, the study was only two years, and after that study, everyone could get the drug beta seron, or if you converted to CDMS or clinically definite multiple sclerosis, in other words, you had an attack or a new lesion on MRI, you could then get the drug. There were 468 people in the original study, and 284 entered the extension study. Now, of course, there could be a bias in who dropped out, but they analyzed characteristics of baseline, and there weren't huge differences between people who continued the trial and dropped out for what it's worth. 178 of those 284 were in the early treatment group. In other words, they got beta seron right away. And 106 were in the delayed treatment group, meaning they originally got placebo and later got beta seron. And the average delay in treatment in the delayed treatment group was 1.53 years. Not two years, because some of them had an attack and then got in the drug. Now, we would like to see, is there a difference, say, between being treated with beta seron for 15 years versus being treated with placebo for 15 years? But we're not seeing this. We're really only looking at the effect of early treatment, the first 1.5 years or so. So we shouldn't be expecting light and day differences, but is there any difference at the end of 15 years. That's what we're looking for. Now, unfortunately, not everyone was actually evaluated in person. So 199 were evaluated in person, 62 were interviewed by telephone. Can you do formal cognitive testing or a formal expanded disability status scale, a measure of multiple sclerosis disability used in research by telephone? No, but at least they attempted. And they say they went through great lengths to track down people, especially with more advanced disability. And their retention was really good. At 8.7 years, they had 258 out of 200. 84 people, and at 11 years, 
278 were enrolled. And they have another publication at the end of 11 years, and they showed benefits in the early treatment group in cognitive function, in risk of conversion to clinically definite multiple sclerosis, but no differences in disability as measured by the EDSS or expanded disability status scale in, in their research. So they didn't show a clear benefit in the standard disability scale at the 11-year study. At 15 years, 261 out of 284 were enrolled, although of course some of these were just phone calls, 161 in the early treatment group versus 100 in the delayed treatment group. These are the baseline characteristics of people in the study. Just focus on people in the extension phase circled here. 161 were originally randomized to beta seron, 100 originally got placebo. The average age was 30 at the start of the study in both groups, so now they're around 45 at the end of the study, and about 70% were women matching the overall percentage in the general population of MS. And the median EDSS, expanded disability status score, was only 1.5 in both groups. That's very low. So again, this was early, mild multiple sclerosis. Now, they were also concerned about people who got steroids for the first attack because, of course, you could improve after getting steroids. And about 70% received steroids in both groups. And in terms of number of T2 lesions on MRI, they were about the same, 19 in the beta seron group versus 17 in those who originally got placebo, about the same. So these groups were well matched. There wasn't some crazy bias in terms of people dropping out and not entering the extension phase. And the two groups received similar treatment throughout the rest of the study. So this is at year 15. Most people were on some kind of disease-modifying therapy, 61.5% in the early treatment group, people who originally got beta seron versus 62% in the delayed treatment group. And a lot of them were still on some form of interferon beta, not necessarily beta seron, 37.4% in the early treatment group versus 37.1% in the delayed treatment group. Now, some of them had escalation to a stronger therapy. For instance, 16.8% in the early treatment group versus 16.1% in the late treatment group. And some people had a second escalation or step two escalation to an even stronger treatment, 6.2% in the early treatment group and a little more 8% in the delayed treatment group. But these numbers are all roughly the same. Now we move to the results. First, we'll look at relapses, attacks, which we're trying to prevent. And there was a trend towards fewer overall relapses in the early treatment group by 15.7% less relapses, but it was actually not statistically significant. P-value roughly 0.1. To be statistically significant, it would have to be less than 0.05. And the reason for this is there were relatively few relapses overall. So the overall annual relapse rate, relapses per person per year, was around 0.2. In other words, over 15 years, the typical person in the study was only having one relapse every five years or a total of three relapses throughout the study. Not too bad. There was a difference early on. The mean time to first attack was longer, 1,888 days with early treatment versus about half that time, 931 days with delayed treatment. So for certainly those first First few years, beta seron made some difference. Next, we move to MRI outcomes. Now, I would just ignore this. I think it's unreliable. You'll see why in a second. For one thing, they didn't have data on a lot of people. They only had MRI data in 68.4% of people in the early treatment group and 58% in the delayed treatment group. And this study is not that long ago. These people should have had MRI scans. I'm not sure what happened here. Now, I would have looked at total number of T2 lesions that are new total number of enlarging lesion, total number of gadolinium enhancing lesions throughout the course of the study. But they actually looked at something else, which was new lesions at the year 11 scan compared to the prior scan. It's sort of an arbitrary point in time, and I wouldn't really expect early beta seron to make that much of a difference on new MRI lesions like 10 years later when both people are on drug. There was a slight difference. 47% in the early treatment group had new lesions versus a little bit more, 51.7% in the delayed treatment arm. This was not statistically significant. And again, just the wrong analysis. Now we look at disability. This is the expanded disability status score, or EDSS, and it's color-coded. The 
dark gray is the overall cohort. Light gray is early treatment, people who got beta serine right away. And medium gray is delayed treatment, people who got placebo and then later beta serine. And you can see most people, around 62%, ended up with an EDSS, which was low between 0 and 2.5. This is mild disability. 3 to 3.5 would be moderate disability, around 15 to 20% ended up in this category. 4 to 5.5 would be some walking impairment. And greater to equal to 6 would be requiring a cane to walk 100 meters or worse. And you can see it was about the same. There were no statistically significant differences. In fact, the early treatment group had a slightly higher mean EDSS of 2.55 versus 2.43 in the delayed treatment group. Of course, this is a trivial, statistically insignificant difference. And also of note, generally speaking, these groups both did pretty well. How many ended up in wheelchairs after 15 years? Very few, only 2.7%. So if I have a 30-year-old patient with mild early multiple sclerosis, low disability, and they ask me, what is my risk of requiring a wheelchair after 15 years? It's quite low. What about cognitive function? I'm showing the results of the PACE-AT. This is the PACE Auditory Serial Addition Test. So this is a cognitive test that's done where you hear a series of numbers. For instance, let's say you hear one and then six, and you add them together. So you would say seven, and let's say the next number is five, you would ignore the fact that you said seven and add the five and the six and say 11, and let's say the next number is two, you would add the two and the five and say seven, and it's very very difficult because you have to ignore what you're saying and just pay attention to the numbers. This is the pace at three where there's three seconds between numbers. There's also a pace at two where the numbers come at you very quickly and it's extremely difficult. But anyway, there was a difference here. The early treatment did better. That's the group in light gray versus the darker gray, the delayed treatment. And actually they started off worse. Their baseline score was lower and they shot up and remained superior throughout the study. And this was a statistically significant difference. P-value is 0 0.0036, hard to ignore. But by the end of the study, after 15 years, they were roughly the same with the early treatment group only marginally higher, 51.4 versus 51.1. And of course, you may say, this is bias. They were all unblinded. They knew they got beta serine. They were more confident. But if you look closely, even during the blinded phase of the experiment, they shot up pretty quickly. And so that suggests there may be a real effect here. There may be something going on. What about conversion to secondary progressive MS? Some people, as they get older, they stop having attacks. They start slowly getting worse. It's definitely associated with long-term disability in MS. And there were no differences. 9.9% converted to progressive MS in the early treatment group, and slightly less, actually, but not statistically significantly different, 9.0% into the delayed treatment group, which, interestingly, is weird because, as I mentioned earlier, at the 11-year study, there was less conversion to secondary progressive MS in the early treatment group, only 4.5% versus 8.3% in the delayed treatment group. So suddenly, people in the delayed treatment group stabilized, and in the early treatment group, they sort of caught up and more people developed progressive MS. But at 15 years, there were no meaningful differences. What about quality of life? Well, they gave people a health-related quality of life survey called the EQ5D. It, on average, remained roughly stable throughout the study, and there were no differences between the two groups. What about employment? So here you can see that baseline at the beginning of the study is colored in light gray, and the darker gray is at the end of the study, year 15. 74.7% were employed at baseline, and by the end of the study, it only dropped to 66.3%. Not too bad. Other studies show significantly greater losses in employment. Again, this group had sort of milder, early early multiple sclerosis. Some people work part-time, but if you look at long-term disability, it only increased from 3.1% to 7.3%. Not too bad. A lot of other people were retired early or were homemakers. And of course, some people may have had other effects on employment, such as making less money or working part-time. There were no differences in employment between the two groups. Getting randomized to beta serine early on did not prevent disability. And finally, we move to the whole point 
point of the study, which is does starting beta serine actually prevent you from getting multiple sclerosis? So this graph looks at the probability of getting diagnosed with clinically definite multiple sclerosis. And you can see people in the early treatment group, the dotted line, had a lower risk of getting MS versus the solid line. Now, as I explained earlier, the diagnostic criteria changed. Most of these people have multiple sclerosis anyway, but bear with me here. So the probability of getting definite MS by year 15 was 67.6% in the early treatment group versus 73.5% in the delayed treatment group. In other words, people who originally got placebo. Now, if you pull out a calculator, this is an 8% relative reduction or a 5.9% absolute reduction. Not that much, but if you put that in number needed to treat, you have to give beta serine to 17 people for 1.5 years, and you'll prevent one person from getting a formal diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, maybe that's worth it. Now, the article actually claims through a Kaplan-Meier estimate, the hazard ratio is 0.695, which would be a 30% reduced risk of multiple sclerosis. And let me say very clearly, I don't believe them. That makes no sense. I have no idea what they're talking about. At the end of the study, there was a 5.9% absolute reduction in the risk of getting multiple sclerosis. If a statistician is watching this, feel free to read the article and correct me if I'm wrong. They also looked at safety with long-term use, and the investigators thought that beta serine was not associated with any serious adverse events or deaths that could be attributed to the drug. So to summarize, was early treatment with beta serine better? Well, in terms of prevention of a definite diagnosis of MS, yes, it was better, but the absolute difference was small, only 5.9%. What about prevention of relapses? Well, maybe there were 15.7% fewer relapses, not statistically significant, but what do you expect? I mean, there was only a difference in treatment for 1.5 years out of 15 years. Given that 15.7% difference is pretty significant, it couldn't be much better. MRI, I have no idea. I don't like the way they did the analysis. In terms of disability, as measured by EDSS, no difference. Conversion to secondary progressive MS, no difference. What about cognitive function? Well, maybe there was. There was a difference through most of the study that was highly statistically significant, but at year 15, there were no differences. And in terms of employment or reported quality of life, no difference whatsoever. So beta serin seemed to do something, but the results are really not that impressive. Now, of course, we're talking about 1.5 years of treatment with a low efficacy medication. It could be much different if we looked at a higher efficacy medication, five or 10 years of treatment versus placebo. Maybe we would be looking at huge, easily measurable differences in disability and employment. I don't know. What the researchers were trying to improve is there's an urgency to get on beta serin right away you can't wait even one or two years. I don't think they really proved that, though of course this was a group with milder multiple sclerosis, many of which did fairly well whether they were treated or not. I'd be interested to know what you think. Do you think beta serine works or do the early proponents of beta serines have to eat their words and do you have ideas for other videos?